can't imagine a life without having this sense of curiosity. In fact, animals have been important to me from as long as I can remember. imagine a life without without having any questions of curiosity. The most wonderful days of my whole life animals have been those early days. To me. Play. You can act out some of your fantasies and some of your dreams and you can take yourself in imagination to places where one day you hope to go. Hello everyone and welcome to our live event, Storytime with Dr. Jane Goodall, featuring the global premiere of Dr. Jane's reading of her book, Lion Family. My name is Alicia Waters and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Crate and Barrel, which includes our children's brand, Crate and Kits. I'm so honored to be your host today and giddy to hear the reading of this story, which I've been so looking forward to. We're glad that you could join us to celebrate this launch in our Crate and Barrel and Jane Goodall Institute uh, Foundation partnership. We're so happy to support them. In honor of this partnership, Dr. Jane is here first to share with us her thoughts about the story that we're about to hear, as well as to answer a few of our questions. So welcome, Dr. Jane. Thank you. As many of you know, Dr. Jane is an animal behavior expert and environmentalist. She's known for her important research with chimpanzees in a place called Gombe, Tanzania, which is in Africa. Today, Dr. Jane spends time fighting for issues she cares about nonstop. We've been spending some time together and I know how hard she works about these issues that we sh that she cares about. And truly they're issues we should all care about, like changes to our climate, being kind and compassionate to animals and helping other families and people who might be struggling. Dr. Jane is a hero to so many, including me, and I hope that she becomes a hero to all of you. Dr. Jane, we're really excited to hear your reading of The Lion Family, but before we begin, can you tell us a little bit about your love of lions and how this story came about? Well, of course, when I first began dreaming of Africa, lions played a major part because, you know, lions and Africa is sort of is synonymous, isn't it? And the first trip that I was ever able to make, and this was before I got to Gombe, was on the Serengeti Plains. And I was working for Dr. Leakey he was doing a dig searching for the prehistoric remains of early humans. And I was allowed to walk out on the plains in the evening, just walking and all the animals were there. And one evening I met this young male lion and he followed me for uh, the length of two or three uh, football, football fields. It was very exciting. And I think that was the moment when Leakey decided that I was the person he'd been looking for to go and study chimpanzees. So lions have always played an important part. And when I was doing this little series of books about African animals, obviously lions were very important. And that's how this book came to be written. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that story. And I can't wait to hear you read more about your experiences with the lions. Um, Dr. Jane, since we have so many young viewers today, can you tell us a little bit about your program for kids, uh, Roots and Shoots? Roots and Shoots began way back in 1991 
because I met so many young people who were concerned about the future and they were learning how we damage this planet. And so many of them told me, well, you've harmed our future. There's nothing we can do about it. And we have harmed the future of young people. We're still harming it. We're stealing it actually, as we continue to use up nature's uh, finite natural resources. But I thought, no, it's not too late to do something about it. So Roots and Shoots, which is now in 66 countries, involves young people from preschool, university, everything in between, even adult groups are beginning to form. Its main message, every individual makes a difference every day. And every group chooses, they choose, projects to help people, to help animals, and to help the environment. So it's changing lives. It's giving young people hope because when you take action and it's all about taking action, you realize that you actually do and can make a difference. That's really inspiring to me because I think looking around this world, sometimes it is easy to get discouraged. And I love this idea of taking action and finding simple ways to do it. Um, at Creighton Kids, we're excited to support you in this partnership and to open our own chapter of Roots and Shoots um, this fall. As part of that, we have, we're working with the Jane Goodall Institute on a change maker pledge that encourages kids and families to make a difference every day, just as Dr. Jane said. Um, for more information, for those of you listening, um, visit rootsandshoots.org slash pledge. And just some, you know, just a snippet of some of the things you can do are things like growing and protecting green spaces with your family, helping your family to reduce the waste that it creates and getting outside to explore nature. So I think those are really uh, things that we can all strive to do in our daily lives. Um, I think it would be great if we could now um, cue the, uh, the, the, the reading actually. Hello, here's Dr. Jane again, and uh, I'm going to read you another book from this lovely little series. Let's see, let's see. The Lions, the King of Beasts, the Lion Family book. Here we are, the Lion Family book. Again, want you to be sure it's by me. And uh, so, here we go. I'll never forget the evening three male lions invaded our camp. That was me and Hugo. Our African cook, Anyango, was preparing supper when suddenly he looked up and there was a lion's head stuck through the tiny kitchen tent. He threw pots and pans at the lion. Luckily, it went away. Another lion investigated the cook's sleeping tent. The tent was zipped shut so the lion tore a hole in the side with his powerful claws. Finally, all three lions came prowling around the tent where Hugo and I were waiting for our supper. And then, luckily, they wandered off into the African night. They were just curious. Until a few months before, they'd lived with their family group or pride. But when they were almost grown, the adult males of their pride had pushed them out into the world to find their own food and their own females. I knew their pride well. Yuga and I were camped in their hunting grounds on the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania. There were three lionesses, two big males and six half-grown cubs. The two males, Leo and Simba, were brothers. Once they had roamed on their own after being driven out of the pride where they were born. And now they had a pride of their own. Tawny was about nine years old. The other two lionesses, Amber and Jade, were younger. The six cubs were all that remained of the babies that had been born the year before. There had been 13 to start with, but the African plains can be cruel. Many cubs die because there's not enough to eat or they're killed by other hunters, like hyenas, leopards. The three sisters, Jade, Amber and Tawny, usually hunted together. First, they looked for a small herd of wildebeest, zebras or antelopes. 
they placed themselves around the edges of the herd, always making sure that their powerful cat smell was not blowing towards the animals. Tawny was the most experienced and often selected the prey. Which one would they chase? She would creep forward inch by inch, getting as close as she could before charging. It's an amazing sight to see a lioness stalking. She uses every tiny shrub or tuft of grass to break up her distinctive lion shape. If one of the prey looks towards her, she freezes until the animal relaxes and begins to feed or move again. And then she suddenly charges a streak of golden fur and powerful muscles. Tawny would chase the prey towards one of the younger lionesses who made the kill. I always hated to watch them killing other animals, but they had to eat and usually they strangled their prey quickly. Then the lionesses fed, eating as much as they could before Leo and Simba charged up and took over the carcass. Male lions usually leave the hunting to the females. It's harder for the males to hide because of their great manes. And since they're so big and strong, they can easily keep the females from feeding until they've eaten their fill. But when Amber Jade and Tawny killed a very large animal, Leo and Simba would let them share. The youngsters always had to wait until the adults had finished. The lions of a pride are very friendly with each other. After feeding, they lie close together, dozing in the shade of a tree. When they greet, they rub up against each other and purr. Yes, they purr like cats. On the Serengeti, there's a long dry season when no rain falls and the plains become dry, brown and dusty. The lions find it hard to get food. Yet Amber got fatter and fatter, and I knew she was going to have babies. She had three. For four weeks, they stayed hidden away behind some big rocks, blind and helpless, just like newborn kittens. When they came out and began to play in the sunshine, they tumbled and tripped over every stick and rock, learning to walk, like our babies. Soon they got stronger and more agile, and played just like kittens. They chased insects, pounced on leaves that blew in the wind, and jumped onto each other and rolled over and over. What fun they had. Amber left her cubs on their own in the den while she went hunting with the pride. When she came back and called to them with low mewing sounds, they tumbled out with little cries of pleasure. She licked them rubbed her huge head against their tiny bodies, then rolled over on her back so that they could suckle. Afterwards, they curled up and went to sleep. When the cubs were eight weeks old, Amber led them to join the rest of the pride. Six young lions were the first to investigate the new babies. The cubs spent a lot of time playing, wrestling, chasing, pouncing and swatting. Almost everything they did in their games served as practice for the stalking and hunting skills that would help them survive as adults. When Amber's cubs were a little older, she'd fetch them after a kill had been made so they could learn to eat meat instead of just drinking milk. She'd growl and snarl at them when they tried to suckle and bat at them with her paws. These cubs were lucky though, Jade, who wasn't their mother, would always let them nurse from her. The females of a pride always share responsibilities in this way. Sometimes Leo would let the little ones play with his tail. When he began to get irritated, he waved his tail just like a cat. And then the cubs pounced more and more wildly, and he got more irritated and waved his tail faster, and in the end, he usually snarled and hit them away with one of his huge paws, but he didn't hurt them. The year-old cubs were now learning how to hunt and followed the lionesses when they went hunting. At first they were more of a nuisance than a help, but gradually they got better. This was especially important for the young males, who would soon be driven away by Leo and Simba and forced to fend for themselves 
until they found females to hunt for them. Leo and Simba are young and strong and well able to defend their family from roaming rival males. At night, the air is often shaken by their great roars. I can't do it very well, but it's... Amber Jade and Tawny join the chorus. The roars die away to those low coughing grunts. From the far distance, the voices of the other lions reply, rising above the sounds of the African night, the calling of hyenas, the lowing of the wildebeest, and the high-pitched barking of the zebras. Magnificent, beautiful, and free. No wonder the lion is known as the king of the beasts. Just look at him. Lions are becoming endangered. Their habitat's being destroyed. People still go and hunt them just to put their heads on the wall. Isn't that awful? But we're going to do our very best to protect them. The king of beasts, beautiful, magnificent, and designed to be free. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Jane. That was wonderful. So vivid and I feel actually like I've just been transported to Tanzania. I'm sure many of us do. Um, and it really brings the animals to life. What a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank you. As we, as, we, <laughs> as we head into the last part of the event, we have a few questions from our audience that I'd love to share with you while we have your time. Um, our first question comes from Ms. Genesis Butler a 13 year old activist with big plans to help save the earth. She actively discusses the impacts of animal agriculture on climate change. Genesis recently founded two organizations, Youth Climate Save and Genesis for Animals, a nonprofit that helps fund animal sanctuaries. Hi, Dr. Goodall. I recently saw a video of you helping release chimpanzee and he gave you a hug before he left. I thought it was the cutest thing ever. So I was just wondering, how did that make you feel when he hugged you before he left? Well, it was honestly. I believe Dr. Jane is on mute. We're having a few tech issues. Now, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay, good. Uh, well, so uh, that, that was the very first day I ever met this. She was a female actually, Wunda. In the native language, Wunda means close to death. And when she came as a little infant, she was wounded by the bullet that killed her mother because chimpanzee females are shot for bushmeat. And she was cured by a wonderful veterinarian, Rebecca. And then when she was about eight years old, she again got really, really sick. And again, she nearly died. And again, Rebecca saved her. And on this very special day, we took her to this beautiful island to join other chimpanzees there, more or less in freedom. And as I say, it was the first day I met her. I hadn't met her before. And yet when she came out of the cage, as you saw, she climbed on top of it. She looked all around and then she came and gave me this amazing hug, much longer than a normal chimpanzee hug. And it was unbelievably special and very moving. That is lovely. Um, next, we will hear from Emily Calandrelli. She's an American scientist, former MIT engineer, and the host and executive producer of Emily's Wonder Lab on Netflix. Hi, Dr. Goodall. My name is Emily Calandrelli, and I wanted to ask 
kids who want to help make the world a better place, but may be overwhelmed by just how big the problems are. Well, the problems are really very, very big. And you've only got to turn on the turn on the TV or the radio or read the newspapers or talk to people to know how we are damaging this planet, how our disrespect of nature and animals led to the pandemic we're all suffering from now and also led to climate change. And it can seem, as you say, completely overwhelming, but you hear all the time, think globally, act locally. But I find if you think globally, you get depressed. However, in our youth program, Roots and Shoots, it's all about taking action locally. So if you get together with, with other young people in your area, you find that together you can clean up a little stream. You can clean the beach of, of um, plastic. You can plant trees and help to restore a forest. And when you see that all around the globe in all 60, 66 countries where Roots and Shoots is growing, and other programs of the same sort, then you realize, gosh, it's happening. We are changing the world. And then you dare to think globally because together, all working together, making ethical choices each day, we can change the world. And, you know, if we start thinking about the choices we make with what we buy, how was it made? Did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? And we choose to buy ethical products, then we're making a huge difference. If we refuse to buy products and companies that do things wrong, then they'll change and it's happened. And by the way, I loved um, Genevieve, your, your program to stop factory farming because that is partly responsible for much illness and much environmental destruction. So we shouldn't eat meat, that's something else we can do. It will make a big difference. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Jaquiel John Jackson, a 12 year old boy from Chicago, um, who is doing wonders to help feed the homeless. Jaquiel's question I just got word of is what fueled you to persevere in your philanthropic work despite any obstacles that you may have encountered? Well, I'm a very obstinate person and I'm not going to allow other people or problems to grind me into the ground. And I guess, you know, I grew up in, in World War II and at times it seemed all so hopeless, you know, where I am at home now is where I grew up. And just on the other side of the, uh, of the ocean here was Nazi Germany. And we weren't really protected. There was a little bit of scaffolding and barbed wire but we had Winston Churchill telling us to get together and be strong and we would overcome. And I think that played quite a major part in who I am today, as well as a mother who told me I could achieve anything if I really wanted to and I worked really hard and I didn't give up. And so, as I say, by nature, I'm, I'm obstinate, but also, I know we have this little window of time and it's closing. We have to get together now and take action to try and slow down climate change and heal some of the wounds that we've inflicted. I love what you're saying around being passionate, being resilient and taking things step by step. I think that's something that the parents and children listening can all um, kind of take and move forward with in their own lives. It looks like we have a few more minutes. Let's take some questions from our viewers, shall we? Um, okay, first question from Grace Harper. What is one memory Dr. Goodall has of chimpanzees or other wildlife that has stuck with her and taught her a lesson? Well, I think one of, one of the things I will never forget is when David Greybeard, the first chimpanzee who lost his fear of me, and he's always close by because he's very <laughs> handsome and very special. And I was following him and he stopped and I sat near him and there was a nice ripe palm nut on the, on the ground. So I held it out to him on the palm of my hand and he turned his face away. So I put my hand closer and he reached out, he took the nut, dropped it. He really didn't want it, but very gently squeezed my fingers. 
And that's how chimpanzees reassure each other. So in that one moment, we communicated with a gestural language that clearly predated human spoken language. He understood my motives, even though he didn't want the nut. And I realized that he understood my motives and didn't want the nut. It was a very special moment. We have two more questions. The, the second to last one is from Nicole Pavlin. What's Dr. Goodall's favorite fact about lions? Favorite fact about lions, I think, is that they're just such, a, such an iconic part of the African landscape. And they're so beautiful, they're so graceful. And as I said in the story, I don't like watching them hunt, but I love watching them rest and the cubs play. And when they've made the kill, I love to watch how they will either share or bat the others away and how the hyenas creep up and want to steal some. So they're just a very, very major part of the African landscape. And our last question comes from Nix Black. What inspired you to become a voice for the vo voiceless? I've always loved animals since I was a tiny little girl growing up in England. And when I was 10, I dreamed of going to Africa, living with animals and writing books about them. And when I realized how we're destroying their habitats, how animal numbers are decreasing, how species are becoming extinct, when I realized how we torture animals in our factory farms, understanding that each animal, each pig, each cow, each chicken, they're sentient beings, they have feelings and emotions. And I, I, it, it hurts me so much to think of the cruelty to animals, the ways in which racehorses are trained and greyhounds, dog racing, the testing of animals in medical research, the way they're treated, the way they're treated as just things. That's why I speak out for them because they can't speak for themselves. And fortunately, partly through Roots and Shoots, but partly through people all around the world, more and more groups are springing up to take care of animals, to rescue them from factory farms, uh, to, to rehome stray dogs, to fight against the trophy hunting business. Almost every problem has a group of people working to put it right. And I want to inspire more people around the world to do just that. Well, are there, do you have any additional thoughts to share, Dr. Jane? Well, I think, you know, the most important message for everybody right now is that every single day, each one of us lives, we make some impact on the world. And we have a role to play, even if we don't yet know what it is. And within all of us is an indomitable spirit, but so many people don't realize the power they have to make change. And so if we can learn to grow that indomitable spirit, the sort of spirit that makes people tackle the impossible and not give up. So everybody can make ethical choices in how they live each day. And with millions and maybe billions of people making ethical choices in how they live and their own environmental footprint and big businesses being pushed to have more, uh, more ethical ways of conducting their business and governments understanding that we really need to protect the environment for future generations, then it's so important to remember that you, you, you make a difference. Every one of us does every day. Thank you so much. Let us all rise our indomitable spirit. Um, this is all the time that we have for questions. I just want to, again, thank Dr. Jane and her team. Um, thank you, Dr. Jane, for sharing your beautiful, wonderful story and for everything that you're doing to make our world a better place and to help us be more protective of our natural resources. I'd also like to thank our guests. Thank you for joining us today and celebrating this exciting partnership that we have with the, the Jane Goodall Institute. Let's continue to be inspired and work together and please check out our Changemaker pledge. Again, it's at rootsandshoots.org slash pledge. Um, and join us as we take action for other people, animals, and this planet that we love. Thanks everyone, have a great afternoon.
And thank you, Alicia.